Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft might open up the Windows Store, Facebook's internal PR email, and all the new Apple stuff. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have got a packed house today. Joining us, UK Associate Editor from the Mac Observer, Charlotte Henry. Welcome back. Hello. Nice, quiet, and slow news day to join you on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we scheduled Charlotte before we even knew that this was happening, so it was quite fortuitous. That's how in uh, sync we are. We also have the hosts of the Snob OS cast, uh, the Snob OS show, including uh, Tech Savvy Diva, Nika Monford. Uh, welcome back. Glad to be back. Always glad to be with you guys. It was good to, to hear your voice yesterday on the new Teching While Black segment on the show. Thank you for doing that for us as well. Very welcome. And of course, her co-host on Snob OS Show, Terrence Gaines. Welcome back, Terrence. Hey, how's it going? How's it going, everybody? Good to have you. Good to have you. We were just talking about kind of our own personal takes on the Apple stuff, like what stuff we might want to get, what we're thinking about. If you want that wider conversation, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Fitbit announced the fashion-focused Lux Fitness Tracker, available for pre-order now for $149.95, although no release date was announced. Fitbit claims the Lux offers five days of battery life with a buttonless color OLED touchscreen and can monitor heart, sleep, oxygen saturation, and standard fitness activity. Ooh, first Fitbit under the new Google regime, right? Uh, PayPal plans to launch a local wallet in China focused on cross-border payments rather than competing with domestic payment systems. In January, PayPal became the first foreign firm with 100% ownership of a payments platform in China. The Wall Street Journal sources say that Discord has ended its talks with three companies, including Microsoft, about a possible sale. Discord prefers to stay independent and is exploring the option of a stock IPO. I uh, saw some collective sighs of relief in our Discord about that earlier. Uh, Venmo added support for four types of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash. No Dogecoin, sorry. Uh, users cannot yet make purchases with crypto. You can just buy, sell, or hold it using your linked bank account or debit card. World Design Guide, Guide published details on its annual awards and outed a new HTC VR headset called the Vive Air before it was announced. The Vive Air is a wireless headset with breathable, quick-drying materials aimed for fitness uses. That's all the rage with VR these days. Components are easy to pull off and wash. And HTC told Engadget the design is a concept with elements that you may see in future HTC products as well. ViveCon 2021 starts May 11th when we expect we'll hear official details on this headset all right we have another facebook leaked email but this one's from facebook to itself sarah what's this about all right so dutch outlet data news reports that it received an internal email from facebook detailing its pr response to recent coverage of public user data being scraped and then aggregated by malicious actors it was first sold online and then recently made available for free to be clear this was data that users had made public themselves but a flaw in a Facebook tool made it a lot easier for people to access and then perhaps use for malicious purposes. The email about the incident that was dated on April 8th detailed a long-term press strategy for coverage of data scraping. Discussing long-term plans, the email said, quote, we expect more scraping incidents and think it's important to both frame this as a broad industry issue and normalize the fact that this activity happens regularly, end quote. A proposed follow-up blog post to detail anti-scraping work and provide more transparency, saying, quote, we hope this will help to normalize the fact that this activity is ongoing and avoid criticism that we aren't being transparent about particular incidents, end quote. So one way to see this is Facebook wants to educate the public about what these incidents actually are, what people are doing, while explaining what it's doing to make it harder to access public data to then be abused. Another way you might see it is that Facebook cares more about its image than it does about anything else, like user data and privacy. So uh, let's go around the horn and get everybody's uh, thoughts on this. Charlotte, we'll start with you. What do you think about uh, Facebook's strategy here? Look, I think I'm going to have to go with your last take, the more cynical one. This is a company <laughs> that has kind of, it's regularly gotten a mess over these incidents. At least it's, pro it's probably 
properly acknowledging how serious they are and how much they concern users. But just because, for me, it would be a far better use of the vast resources that company has to better protect user privacy and data than spend time trying to mitigate the problems when they go wrong. I think we have all, as consumers, come to accept that data privacy incidents happen. We we know that. We every, but in you know I'm thinking back to like the Marriott Hotel one and stuff. That sometimes mm-hmm. you're thinking maybe the company could have done a little bit more to protect me. And I would like it if Facebook put its resources into that instead of a you know a bit of spin and PR. Terence, do you agree with Facebook that this is a broad industry issue, or do you think Facebook has unique challenges? Well, so I was just going to say and speak on the fact that they wanted to frame it as a broad industry issue. Now, I don't know how that sounds to y'all, but to me, that sounds like, okay, snitch on everybody else, throw everybody else under the bus as well. So it's like, I'm, which one is it? Are you going to take onus of this and say, hey, we're working on this, we're doing this, we're doing that, or are you going to say, hey, look at them over there, they're doing it too. Which one is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nika, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I'm not sure how you feel about Facebook these days. Um, I think it's par for the course for Facebook. And like you said, they care more about their image. I think we've seen that in the links that Facebook went to, uh, to have the full page ads about the data privacy that comes in, um, in iOS 14 and the tracking and framing it as we're looking out for the small guys, the small businesses, framing it in a way that it takes a little bit of the, the spotlight off them to say, see, we're, we're only bringing this up to help other people when ultimately they brought it up to, to help themselves. I'll be honest. I, I thought it was going to be worse when I saw the headline. And when you're talking about an internal email, people are concerned with the image PR wise, uh, I, I think this was actually fairly tame and and shows that uh, the PR people at Facebook all, always have uh, one one eye on the fact that their emails could be leaked at any time. Uh, so, right. you know, I was I, I was surprised that it was as measured as it was. Well, cool. remember, remember those PR and comms people are led by a very previously very senior politician here in the UK who was used to his emails perhaps being, of a, you know, you can get freedom of information requests, I think, on a lot of government material. So, Deputy Prime Minister, right? Former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Former Bank. Deputy Prime Minister. Nick Bank. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right, what about uh, Windows? All right, so Windows sources, Windows Central sources, rather, say that Microsoft is working on a brand new store app for Windows 10, designed to be more open to both end users and also developers. Right now, the Windows Store requires developers to package apps as an MSI 6, M6, and use Microsoft's update and e-commerce platforms. It is somewhat limiting that way. The new store reportedly will let devs submit EXE or MSI packages, also host apps, and manage updates on their own CDNs, also permit the use of third-party commerce platforms in apps. That, at least, would mean that Microsoft wouldn't get a cut of the revenue. The Verge points out that the security could be handled the same way it is for Microsoft's Windows Package Manager, which handles many non-store apps right now. Package Manager uses static, analysis, SHA-256 hash validation, and also smart screen. The new store may be part of the Sun Valley overhaul expected to come to Windows later this year. Yeah, this, this if it bears out, uh, is a total reversal from current App Store trends, right? Uh, not taking a cut. Uh, letting anybody host their own updates and their own stores. This is Microsoft repositioning and saying, you know, nobody wants to use our our app store right now because it's such a mess after Windows 8 and Universal. Let's let's just open it up so people will want to use it and users will want to use it because everything they want might be in there. You might get Chrome and Firefox, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I I have to admit, I kind of forgot that there was a Windows 10 store. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not using Windows 10 regularly, but I would still have heard about cool apps or, or you know, new evolution of the store just, you know, in, in our tech circles, but it's been kind of dead. So this seems like a great idea for Microsoft. Is anyone else here excited about a revamped Windows 10 store? <laughs> no. <Wrong> crowd. <laughs> but, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but this could be also be an answer to, you know, the, App Store issues Apple is going through with Epic and, 
you know, all the other things for Windows to say, hey, you know, draw some attention this way. You can do whatever you want on Windows Store. So, you know, give us some attention, right? <laughs> well, it's an interesting test case, isn't it? In two massive companies taking a different model, you know, we know there's, as you say, the Epic Apple case is massive rows between the two companies over the 15% and the 30% take and so on. If, you know, if Microsoft is operating in, operating in a different way, it's a really interesting test case. Yeah, and it's pretty developer friendly too. Uh, I, I think that that's the big thing is like, we, they, they want to repair that relationship. They've been doing a lot to repair that relationship and this is another step. All right, folks, you need a little more explanation on big tech topics out there like, like Thunderbolt. A lot of talk about Thunderbolt today. What is it? Uh, well, we just put out a, uh, a revised episode about Thunderbolt. Also, Wi-Fi 6, USB-C, 5G, and more. Check out our related show, Know a Little More, to know a little more about all that and more at knowalittlemore.com. Let's get into the Apple announcements, starting with the iPad Pro, now with the M1 inside, and what the top model, the 12.9 inch model with a mini LED XDR screen, two terabyte storage option, up to 16 gigs of RAM, supports the PS5 and Xbox controllers, Thunderbolt support in that USB-C port now. It's not just USB-C, 5G built in. Something called center stage that when you're using the camera will keep you in the center of the view, not by moving, but just by some AI that centers you up in the, in the view screen. The 11 inch, $799, 12.9 inch with that mini LED XDR screen, 1099. That's $1,099. Uh, you can start ordering that April 30th, available the second half of May. And Nika, I know you've uh, been thinking, do I want one? Do I want one? Yeah, it's been kind of floating around. I'm not sure uh, if I'm going to pull the proverbial trigger or not. Um, I think I have to think on it a little more uh, to see if it's something I want to to go with. I've been waiting for a larger screen MacBook Pro with M1, so we'll we'll see where where I land. Yeah, it's pretty much just a faster processor and a nicer yeah. screen, right? Basically. Uh, and same price for the 11 inch, but you don't get the nicer screen there. You have to you have to pay a little extra now, uh, up up a hundred dollars for the 12.9 inch version of this. But the 12.9 for me is just too big. I have small hands. It's just it's too big for me to to use the way I currently use my iPad. So. That, that's a good point. Uh, I, I haven't used an iPad in years. Um, I used to use one really regularly. And once the iPhone started getting bigger, I don't know, I just kind of stopped using the last iPad I had was, was 10 inches. So 12.9, you know, I say, oh, that's the nicer screen. That's the one that I want. I mean, hypothetically. I don't have <laughs> don't have the finances to get any of these things we're about to talk about, but but I but I really like the idea of the iPad Pro, but it it to me, even though I know it's not running Mac OS, it it it's more of a laptop than anything mm -hmm. I've ever seen before from Apple, especially with that M1 chip. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That's the one thing holding it back is you can't download apps traditionally like you would on a regular desktop or laptop. And that's probably the one thing that they are purposely possibly holding it back to differentiate from a traditional MacBook because it, you can outfit a 12.9 inch uh, uh, iPad Pro with a fancy keyboard and it has all the USB-C so you can connect the third party 4K, 6K display to it. You know, what's it stopping to replace completely a MacBook Air? Well, obviously not ha not having a Mac OS. So it will be interesting to see how people go for this, you know, depending on all of the app app support, which of course they brought out all the photoshops and they brought out all the gamers, but still that one thing is, can I install like traditional apps on it or do I have to go through an app store? But it's so pretty. <laughs> it's very pretty. It's, That's how they get I you. mean, I was watching it going, I don't need, I've got an iPad I use for reading and a bit of writing. I don't need it. I don't need it. Oh my God, it's so pretty. And it's got two terabytes of memory. Right. Like, <laughs> It's, yeah. I was really surprised with that extra storage too. I was like, it's "Whoa, huge that's storage!" Right? That's what I got in my laptop. Yeah, no, I know. And that's it's... why it's like really confusing. It's like, are they trying to say it's a laptop replacement, but not? But when you give it two terabytes of storage with a nineteen, with a twelve point nine inch screen and the the Pro XDR, I mean, it's kind of like mm -hmm. giving me, you know, laptop replacement vibes. 
Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm i ready to, to take bets on how fast someone hacks it to run Mac OS. Oh, yeah. uh, speaking of something that's pretty, iMac with an M1 chip in seven colors, green, yellow, orange, red, purple, blue, and white, uh, thin because they uh, replaced the bulky thermal system with two small fans. So it's like it, it doesn't bulge out in the back anymore. 24-inch display that they say is just a tiny bit larger than the frame of the 21.5-inch. Uh, the top model gets Ethernet through the power adapter because the power adapter has got uh, Thunderbolt in it. Uh, now with a 1080p camera, works better in low light. Four wow. USB-C ports uh, on the top model, two of which are Thunderbolt, support spatial audio from Dolby Atmos, Touch ID on some of the Magic keyboards, depending on how you configure it. Also got some shortcuts in there. Uh, the keyboards can match the color of the iMac, new mouse and touchpad, also in colors that match the iPad, starting at $1,299. For a choice of four colors, eight gigs of memory, 256 gig solid state drive, and two Thunderbolt ports, no touch ID keyboard. $1,499 gets you an eight core GPU. That's one more core than in the $1,299. Two extra USB C ports, Magic Keyboard with Touch ID, and that Ethernet in the power adapter. Uh, they are available for order April 30th and shipping in the second half of May. And they're very, also very nice looking m machines here. They're, they're gorgeous looking machines. I'm pleased Apple is finally starting to put proper cameras into its devices. This was, sorry, it's non iPhone devices. Let's be clear, that's not fair yeah, to, right. to dismiss the iPhone cameras. But it's really nice to see that. I'm If it was a 27 inch screen, we'd be in shut up and take my money territory. <laughs> I'm and they have the, the only... spatial audio effect of it as well that's mm -hmm. coming to, you know, essentially a, a desktop machine. So I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting as well. I remember when the the first iMacs, you know, were hitting college dorms. And at the time, I was not a Mac person. And I remember thinking, you know, all these colors, you know, it's such a, you know, it's just it, it, very gimmicky. And, you know, they they sold a lot of those iMacs. Um, and then they became streamlined over the years and the colors went away and colors are back. And I have to admit, I was one of those people who's like, ooh, the teal, oh, ooh, the red. But, and I'm not trying to downplay the fact that Apple can repackage something and give it a color and everyone says, I need that color. But most of the color will be on the back, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you get some color looking at you. Most people, not everybody, are gonna have a computer up against a wall. So some of that color is a little bit lost, but I get why uh, they got so much attention. I also, I don't totally know how they got the thing so darn thin, but when you look at it from the side, the foot is kind of the same size. So yes, thin is cool, but you're still kind of taking up the same amount of space when you're on a desk. Well, I was just going to say about the color, Sarah, you don't discount the guy in Starbucks that brings his iMac in. So you got to look out for that guy too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure he will. <laughs> but that, that's what that's marketed for? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the particularly? Guy yeah. With the iMac, yeah. yeah. And yeah, then absolutely. you go, oh, you're the one who got the yellow. I was wondering. <laughs> so who bought that? Now we know. <laughs> All right. A uh, few other things here. The air tags are finally here. Uh, you can personalize them uh, with an engraving, you know, like uh, I saw some some Korean letters and some emojis. Uh, any iPhone with a U1 chip can be used to find the air tag. It uses ultra wideband, uh, has a user replaceable battery, something you can go buy at a 7-Eleven. Uh, rotating identifiers are not shared with Apple. Uh, so they they're, did a lot to try to explain that they're protecting the privacy. And they're not going to get any of this data. $29 for a single AirTag or a pack of four for $99 order on this Friday, April 23rd at 5 a.m., shipping April 30th. Now, if you want to attach them to something, they will also sell you some accessories. A polyurethane loop costs 29 bucks. A leather loop, 39 bucks. Leather key ring holder, 35 bucks. Or, of course, what we're all saving up for, the Hermes keychain ring, $349. Uh, Hermes luggage tag, $449. And the Hermes bag charm, $299. Or, I don't know, Terrence and I were talking about maybe we just get that Belkin one that's in the store for $13. Bucks. That seems like a better deal. <laughs> Well, you know, they 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 rolled out Apple Cash, Apple Card family, so now you can put that on the the installment plan. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, a 
That's what it, your whole family gets it. That's what it's for. Yeah. <laughs> Buy yeah. everyone in the family an Hermes tag, and then that's it. If you use your Apple card, you get cash back, and you get more cash back if you spend that much money. There, you see it now. You see it. It's all coming uh -huh, together now. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, all kidding aside, though, twenty nine bucks for an AirTag. It's not bad, right? Not mm -hmm. bad at all. Not bad. N not if you don't want any of the accessory to actually attach it to stuff. No. Yeah, well, and and it it it's going to compete with Tile, Terrence. I know you have Tile, right. and I know you're saying you're going to try this. You're going to do a little comparison. Well, definitely, and probably the one thing that's going to push me over to Apple is the fact that my Tile keychain holder that also organizes my keys, I have to charge it. And if I don't forget to charge it, then the Tile portion where it can locate my keys is kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. Well, with the AirTags, with the, what, year-long lasting replaceable battery, then I don't have to worry about it for an entire year and then just have to pony up the extra money to get a replacement battery when I'm assuming there's a low battery indicator. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't... I, I imagine the phone that. will tell you like, hey, the battery's getting low, you know? Right, yeah. right. But what I saw was interesting was how precise you can use your iPhone to actually locate this device. It actually shows like arrows that kind of point you to, you know, what side of the room it's on. So I thought that was actually cool. That's something the tile uh, currently does not do. It just pings and gives you like a uh, approximate location versus this is yeah. more precise. Yeah, because I, if I if I have it right, Tile is using sort of a radio delay system, mm -hmm. but it's not ultra wideband. Apple using ultra wideband that does give you a lot more precision. Uh, we covered that on Know a little more. If you want to find out more about how that works, but uh, it seems like AirTags would be the one that most people who have iPhones anyway are, are probably going to dip in and buy. There's also the Apple TV 4K. It's got an A12 Bionic processor, so it can do a, a little bit more, a little more powerful processor, including HDR in high frame rate. It can even do HDR in high frame rate over AirPlay. Uh, they have a nifty trick where you can use an iPhone, uh, hold it up to your TV, and it will communicate with the Apple TV to adjust the picture quality on the Apple TV. So you don't have to adjust it on your television. It'll, uh, it'll color balance for you there. But the thing everybody's talking about is the new remote design. It looks like the second generation Apple TV remote. It's silver with black buttons, uh, click pad that is touch enabled. That outer ring can be can be kind of touched in a circular motion for scrubbing, has a power button and a mute button. The Siri button got moved to the side. I can already hear people complaining about hitting the Siri button all the time when they pick this thing up. Uh, the Apple TV 4K, $179 for the 32 gig version, $199 for the 64 gig version coming April 30th available for shipping in the second half of May. So you can order it on April 30th, shipping second half of May. But if you're like, I already have an Apple TV, can I just get the remote? Yes, you can buy the remote separately for $59, uh, which is more than a Chromecast or many Rokus, but you can if, do it. If the Apple event would have been absolutely nothing except, hey, we just wanted to let you all know that we're getting a new Apple TV remote, I would have been happy. <laughs> I would have been happy. I mean, and it's, it's, you look at the remote and you're like, okay, they made some changes. The biggest change is that when you, you know, when you're not looking straight at it, you feel on the bottom, mm -hmm. oh, this is where the buttons aren't. Instead of it being exactly the same on the top and bottom and the buttons in the middle, it's going to change my life. <laughs> I don't need to, uh, I, I will not complain about the Apple TV any longer as I have for many years. It's I'm very excited about that. I have the pleasure of working with some very calm, very sensible, very balanced, lovely people at the Mac Observer. There's very few things that anger my colleagues. One of them tends to be this old <laughs> Apple TV remote. It's one of the things that gets many of them animated. And I think there'll be a lot of people who are excited. I thought it was also noticeable that, again, buried in one of the Apple press releases, I think for $149, you can get an HD Apple TV with the new remote. Mm -hmm. nice. Which I thought was interesting, maybe as a way of kind of clearing house for the HD Apple TV. Yeah. They're, they're, they're basically don't want to continue to anger people by selling the old remote, is what that, is what that tells What's me. What's that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they also showed us a Ted Lasso trailer and announced Woo! Apple TV Plus uh, is getting a new season of Ted Lasso July 23rd. Uh, Apple Card Family Plan, your spouse and your partners can now share and merge credit lines with equal rights and equal credit building. Billing. There, there had been uh, some complaints that that women were not getting the same credit limit on the Apple Card as, as men. Uh, so this is an attempt to rectify that. You can also have your entire family on a card, uh, everybody 13 plus, any, and do some parental uh, limits. 
podcast is getting a, a redesign. They're adding something called channels that you can subscribe to that'll have multiple podcasts in it and subscriptions so that you can pay certain podcasts for ad-free early access, et cetera. Something we do through Patreon. Apple's going to offer that through their Apple podcasting app directly. And a purple iPhone 12 uh, coming April 30th. Uh, the fastest iPhone announcement they've ever had. Ever. Yeah. yeah. So quick. <laughs> I was very excited by the Ted Lasso trailer, though. It's been a quite frantic 24, 36 hours in the world of soccer, and we all needed a bit of Ted Lasso. What does Ted Lasso think of the rogue league of the Super Exactly. League? Yeah, I must Ted know. Lasso was, Ted Lasso would have got everyone on a table and calmed everyone down. It would be okay. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was surprised. I mean, I know it's just a color, but... Uh, the iPhone 12 saying like, all right, flashy purple. Yay. Willy Wonka song. Okay. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was, it almost seems like it, I don't know, maybe should have been part of an announcement last September and the purple color just wasn't ready. And so they're like, eh, just throw it in the April announcement. Yeah. I agree. It, it was like a blip. Felt, no, sorry. I was just gonna say the whole thing felt a bit breathless, didn't it? Particularly at the beginning. Yeah, Nico, what were you going to say? No, I was just saying, you know, it was like a blip. And I agree with Charlotte. The way they went through, you know, the color, uh, this, uh, uh, what well, Apple Card, and the way they went through the podcast, I mean, he was just, you know, going through those things like he didn't have any time left on this planet. And I was like, wow, what's the what's the rush? And it, it kind of made me excited because I was like, they're trying to get this out of the way because they have some really beefy stuff to show us, you know, the rest of the time. But... Um, yeah, it, it did feel rushed to me at the very beginning, for sure. I'm telling you, they're super proud of that Ted Lasso. They played that entire trailer. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they really could have used some of that time and maybe gone into some uh, details about how uh, intricate they used to make this purple color iPhone 12. <laughs> yeah, they, they also needed to save time for... Want. They needed to save time for Tim Cook parachuting into the Apple campus and right. <laughs> placing an M1 chip in the iPad. All right, uh, let's check out the mailbag. Sarah, what do we got? All right, so thank you to James C. Smith for pointing us to an article on the Houston Chronicle, which quotes the Woodlands Fire Chief Palmer Buck on the fire after a Tesla accident that we discussed yesterday with our guest, uh, Tim Stevens. So yesterday we noted that Harris County Constable Mark Herman said that it took 30,000 gallons of water to extinguish the car fire. And our subsequent conversation mentioned it supposedly took four hours to extinguish. Kind of a big deal. Chief Buck told the Chronicle it took two to three minutes to get the fire under control, adding, after that, it was simply cooling the car as the batteries continued to have a chain reaction due to damage. Buck said that the fire was an example of how firefighters need to keep up with technology. Now, Bodie of the Kilowatt podcast wrote in and said, I'm a firefighter, and one of the biggest issues I see with EV fires, that's kind of like the Tesla story we were talking about yesterday, Buck says, uh, Bodie says, that involved the battery is getting the crews back in service. Water isn't necessarily an issue. The time on scene is the issue. We can't commit crews for 24 to 36 hours to ensure that the battery isn't going to reignite. It's not a good use of their time. They need to return to service so they can take calls. As EVs become more common, fire departments and towing companies are going to need to adapt to overcome these issues. A fire department in the Netherlands filled a dumpster up with water and submerged a BMW i8 to prevent thermal runaway. Bridge Hill sells or it will be selling an EV fire blanket that basically smothers the fire, allowing it to cool down below or not reach thermal runaway temperatures. I have no idea if it works, but it's pretty cool. Bodie says, obviously, the two solutions I gave are impractical, but it's an example of how departments and companies are thinking outside the box. Yeah, no, that, that that's good stuff. Uh, we also still don't know if uh, that car actually did have uh, um, autopilot. autopilot on. Elon Musk has tweeted that it didn't. Uh, but the the county officials have said, well, if he knows that, we'd like him to sh to to share the info uh, with us. But it very well may not have. Uh, and and my opinion on this hasn't changed, uh, which is I I think these were two people that um, were 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 doing something risky and dumb, uh, and and they they shouldn't have. Uh, and it is it is on them, uh, sadly, uh, for that. Uh, and I think the uh, the fire aspect of this is is an important takeaway. And this this is not a Tesla specific thing. It's it's all electric vehicles there. Uh, also, a few uh, follow ups here. AirTag is splash dust and water resistant. 
Uh, we have confirmed, uh, according to iMore, that Apple will take a 30% cut of podcast subscriptions. I don't think anyone's shocked by that, but we know it for sure. Uh, I believe yeah. that's just in the first year of the podcast. That, which would be consistent with their subscription stuff. Then it goes down to 15%. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, so, yeah. So, it's consistent with what they do in the App Store already. Well, thanks to James and thanks to Bodie uh, for writing in and giving us a little bit more of that EV battery context. If you have more context of anything that we talk about in a show, questions about anything we talk about on the show or might talk about in a future show, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Thank you. Also, big shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Logan Larson, Dan Boyles, and David Mosher. Also, thanks to our brand new boss, David Lueza, who just started backing us on Patreon. Good to have you, David. Thank you to our new boss. And thank you to our panel of guests today. Charlotte, we'll start with you. Where can people keep up with your work? Thanks so much. Yes, you can find me at Charlotte A. Henry on the Twitters. Uh, my book, Not Buying It on Fake News, is available on Amazon. And I'm now hosting a show for the Mac Observer called Media Plus, where we look at the world of digital media. And once I even let some guy called Tom know it on. So, yeah. yeah, that was fun. I enjoyed that episode. <laughs> Uh, Nika Monford, one half of Snob West podcast. Where can people keep up with your work? I'm at Tech Savvy Diva across all platforms. And of course, um, we are at Snob West Cast on social media as well. And you'll also hear Nika more regularly on this show, uh, giving us uh, cool folks in the tech industry, Teching Well Black, our newest segment. You heard her voice yesterday. So nice to see you here today. Terrence Gaines, the other half of Snob West. Where can people keep up with you? Sure, you can find me all over the interwebs on the socials at Brother Tech, B R O T H A T E C H. And when I'm not doing that, I am, like they said, one half of the Snob OS cast. Like Nika mentioned, you can find us on Twitter and socials at Snob OS cast. And you can write us on the web at snoboscast.com. Thank you, Charlotte, Nika, and Terrence for being with us. It was a fun Tuesday in the tech world. Folks, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>